uh, I will be paying uh, particular close attention to uh, newborn screening, uh, the work ongoing within uh, neuromuscular diseases more generally, but also then some intersections with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and newborn screening. Um, but I'm going to start with, uh, and then I'll also close with opportunities for you all to get involved uh, with our advocacy efforts. Uh, but I'm going to start just with a brief overview of NB, uh, NBA's advocacy program, as there really are uh, a number of different ways in which NBA's advocacy program is serving the Duchenne muscular dystrophy community. So really everything that MDA does in our public policy and advocacy efforts uh, fall within three main pillars of our mission. The first is to increase access to care and therapies uh, from day one. So for anything that the Duchenne muscular dystrophy community may need in approaching their uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, either through access to a medical device or a treatment or to a specialist or uh, perhaps uh, a physical therapist, a dietitian, uh, other uh, specialists who could contribute to the care of an individual with Duchenne, um, or to telehealth or other ways in which care can be accessed and delivered. We want to be sure that NDA is trying to tackle uh, any barrier that might be in, uh, impeding an individual with Duchenne from actually accessing the care uh, that they would that they would seek. So the second pillar of our advocacy is in accelerating therapeutic development for those with neuromuscular diseases and of course those with Duchenne. Now within Duchenne muscular dystrophy, as you all know, there are several therapies that are already approved by the Food and Drug Administration and on the market. Um, but oftentimes these therapies are perhaps targeted to a specific subset of the Duchenne community that might have a mutation in a specific exon. Or perhaps those therapies are are, are, are improvements upon existing or previous therapies, but uh, perhaps also aren't necessarily uh, game-changing, uh, truly transformative to those uh, with, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so consequently, we know that there is still lots of unmet need, of course, within the Duchenne community, and that additional new innovative therapies are still very much desired. So what we do within this pillar of advocacy is trying to ensure that more and better therapies are uh, coming to the Duchenne community and the entire neuromuscular disease community that much more quickly. And then finally, in our final and third pillar on empowerment and independence, this is where we try to break down the societal barriers that are in front of those with neuromuscular disabilities. These are barriers to accessing education, barriers to accessing employments or other uh, uh, life milestones or goals uh, that our society has been set up in a way that disadvantages those with disabilities. Also access to travel, especially access to accessible air travel. All of these, uh, way, all, in, in all of these areas, uh, those with neuromuscular disabilities uh, have uh, more difficulty than those without a neuromuscular disability. And so what we do in this area of our advocacy is trying to break down those barriers for the community. Just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of more precisely what's happening right now within neuromuscular diseases and within our efforts in these areas, in access to care and therapies uh, from day one, we're working on increasing access to diagnostics. And of course, that includes diagnosis through newborn screening, which we'll be spending much of our time on today. But that also includes ending the diagnostic odyssey more generally, having greater access to genetic testing, as well as greater access to genetic counselors. And then uh, after perhaps the testing has confirmed a diagnosis of Duchenne and a genetic counselor might be working with the family, also access to other specialists, particularly specialists that might be uh, further away or across state lines for individuals who would be seeking to access them through their Medicaid program, but otherwise uh, cannot. We also work within this pillar on uh, access to home and community-based care. We know many individuals with Duchenne, as well as individuals more broadly with neuromuscular diseases, access care or uh, support within the home. Uh, and we want to make sure that not only can that continue, but access to such care or access to such support for acti activities of daily living is actually more accessible than it is today, because we understand for a number of reasons, including inadequate reimbursement, including uh, a labor shortage, including low, uh, low levels of coverage for such care, there are lots of impediments to access and care in the home or as well as support in the home. And we want to, again, knock down those barriers. We want to be sure that individuals with Duchenne can still uh, access telehealth that has been expanded over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we want to be sure that access to telehealth doesn't go away as the pandemic continues or as uh, perhaps maybe one day the pandemic ends. And then just more broadly, access to affordable quality health care and coverage. So, 
a health insurance that actually covers the therapies, that actually covers the specialists, that actually covers the medical devices that we know the, du the Duchenne community needs, and not just health insurance that is private health insurance accessed through uh, perhaps one's employer or accessed uh, through insurance uh, marketplaces, but also public insurance through the Medicare program for those who qualify or through the Medicaid program. Within our accelerating therapeutic development efforts, we're working to innovate clinical trials and working with the Food and Drug Administration as well as Congress to pursue policies that actually make clinical trials run more smoothly, that actually lower the exposure to placebo within clinical trials, uh, perhaps that allow for some innovative ways of comparing multiple therapies within one clinical trial that, again, will advance our understanding of these therapies that much more quickly. We also just want to see the investment in medical research in Duchenne and neuromuscular diseases expanded more broadly. There's still so much that we still have yet to understand uh, with the neuromuscular diseases, including Duchenne, and investing in research at the National Institutes of Health, as well as at the Department of Defense and elsewhere, remains a priority of ours. And then finally, there was a bill that we worked to pass last year called the Act for, for ALS. And it might sound like it's ALS specific, but actually it would benefit the entire rare neurodegenerative disease community. And we do believe it would benefit those with Duchenne as well in ways that innovates at the FDA, as well as ways in that it innovates in therapeutic development for neuro neurodegenerative diseases. And so uh, while we were successful in actually passing this bill out of Congress last year, now we're working on implementing the bill this year. Finally, some of the more specific things we're doing within our final pillar on empowerment independence, as I already mentioned, we're working on making air travel more accessible. For those of you within the Duchenne community who have uh, traveled via airplane, you well know that air travel is one of perhaps the most inaccessible experiences that you can have. Uh, everything from seat transfers from a power wheelchair to an aisle chair, from an aisle chair to an airplane seat, and then reversing that process, that can result in injuries, that can result in falls uh, due to training of airline personnel being in inadequate. Wheelchairs are often damaged in the cargo holds of airplanes or in the transfer to or from a cargo hold of an airplane, uh, sometimes irreparably damaged, and these wheelchairs we know to be oftentimes customized. Uh, to the individual with Duchenne or to the individual with neuromuscular disability. And so consequently, um, the wheelchair damage can lead to injury there as well. And then finally, um, inaccessible lavatories, uh, ticketing practices, having to wait for half an hour to an hour to two hours on the plane to be, uh, de to be deplaned, all our experiences we know the community faces. And consequently, we seek to end these experiences by making air travel more accessible. We're working to make uh, employment opportunities more extensive for those with neuromuscular diseases, including through incentives for businesses to hire those with disabilities, and as well as reorientation to benefit programs to lower the disincentive there might be in place to actually find employment. We're also working on expanding paid leave programs so that uh, those with not only those with neuromuscular disabilities can take more expended time off from work and still be paid uh, if they uh, choose to do so as well as parents of children with neuromuscular disease with being able to take time off for work uh, for whatever reason and still be paid in doing so. And then finally, beyond uh, the economic security that employment potentially can bring, we're also working to expand economic independence and security through a number of other uh, avenues, including through updating benefit structures, uh, such as ABLE age account or ABLE accounts, as well as supplemental security income as well as uh, uh, Social Security Disability Insurance. So as you can see, we have a very broad mandate within NBA's advocacy department. We're working on a lot, and I'm going to mention some ways in which you all can join us uh, here at the end of our conversation. But first, I wanted to uh, take a deeper dive into newborn screening, because really it's actually quite a topical uh, conversation to have with those in the Duchenne community, as there are some really exciting things happening within newborn screening uh, as it pertains to Duchenne muscular dystrophy right now. But before I get to that, let me just give you all a little bit of an introduction on newborn screening, because perhaps it's actually not something that those of you in the Duchenne community have really paid much attention to, uh, because it hasn't been relevant to those with Duchenne, at least uh, perhaps not until recently. So what exactly is newborn screening? Newborn screening is the public health program in which virtually every single baby in the United States that is born receives a heel prick within 24 to 48 hours 
after birth. And then the heel prick results in blood being taken and put onto a blood spot card. And for those of you who perhaps have uh, given birth before, perhaps you've uh, witnessed this process actually occurring uh, within, again, 24 to 48 hours after birth. And then that card with uh, little uh, spots of blood that are on that card from the infant is sent off to a public health laboratory. And there the public health laboratory takes that blood spot card and uh, tests and screens the blood on the card for upwards of 35 to 36 conditions. Most of these conditions are genetic. And all of these conditions have one unifying factor. And that unifying factor is that actually two technically. The first is that actually if th these diseases that are being screened for, for one, they're not evident. They're not clinically evident at birth. Um, instead, uh, the baby otherwise seems to be perfectly healthy. And they may be passing every test that uh, the, uh, the, the, the doctors there may be conducting, and they might actually pass most tests for a while thereafter. And nothing clinically seems to be the matter. But what's actually happening is that there might be some irreversible effects of the disease occurring unbeknownst to the family, unbeknownst to the care team. And uh, these irreversible uh, symptoms, uh, once clinically actually diagnosed later on within the life of the child, as I've said, they're irreversible oftentimes. There's, there might not be, be nothing that can be done with the regression of the disease until finally it's clinically diagnosed later on. Now, what the second unifying factor of these, these diseases is that there actually is a treatment that can be administered that would uh, actually potentially either delay or slow the progression of these symptoms much earlier on within the progression of the disease. And so consequently, newborn screening can really change lives. It can actually save lives in that it uh, can uh, prevent some of the most challenging aspects of these diseases from actually occurring, potentially can even save the lives of some of these infants in the cases of some other uh, diseases such as spinal muscular atrophy or infantile onset Pompe disease. So newborn sc screening is incredibly, incredibly important for these 35 to 36 genetic conditions that, that meet these criteria. They have to be screenable at birth. They have to um, be serious and life-threatening. Uh, there has to be some kind of treatment intervention that can be pursued, and that that treatment intervention avoids some of the potentially most serious impacts of the disease. So what neuromuscular conditions are already included in the newborn screening program? Well, you already heard me mention them. There are SMA, spinal muscular atrophy, and Pompe disease. Uh, these, these two diseases both qualify under uh, what is necessary to be recommended, and I'll get to this process in a second, uh, what is necessary to be recommended for newborn screening. And so right now, actually, they have fairly recently been recommended by the federal government, the states, to be included in state newborn screening programs. So neither are being screened in all 50 states and territories, but we're getting close. Uh, SMA only has a few more states to go, and actually, um, I'll, I'll have a slide on this in a moment. Uh, SMA is, is just a few states away from being there, and Pompeii is a few states behind. But nonetheless, SMA and Pompeii are included in the newborn screening program. So as I already alluded to, as it pertains to how these programs are run, um, these are actually state-run programs. Public health uh, programs are of the jurisdiction of states, not necessarily of the jurisdiction of the federal government. And so consequently, it's up to each state to determine which diseases will actually be screened for within their newborn screening programs. So if you go across different states, it's not just the differences in which, which conditions will actually be screened for, but also the entire process that kicks off from there. It's up to the states to determine uh, what public health laboratory is going to be doing the screening of the blood spot cards that are taken 24 to 48 hours after birth. It's up to the state to determine what timeline that process needs to uh, occur by. Some states have very strict, you have to have this process done within four or five days. Some states aren't quite as strict. Perhaps they allow for a little bit more time. Also, the state has to set up a confirmatory testing process because these newborn screens, they don't necessarily confirm the diagnosis of one of these genetic conditions or one of these uh, conditions that are screened for at birth. As you can hear, I'm using the word screening, which means that this initial screen kind of flags a warning that maybe actually something might be a concern associated with one of these diseases. And then from there, there's a confirmatory diagnostic process. Oftentimes, some, actually sometimes, 
using a genetic test that actually confirms the presence of a, this genetic condition or other condition that is, is present at birth. And so it's up to the state, again, to actually govern that process of confirmatory testing. And then from there, if there actually is a condition that is confirmed uh, to be positive within that infant, then it's up to the state to set up a process for follow-on care and treatment. Now, not everything is governed by the state, but the state usually has programs to assist new parents who just received the diagnosis of a serious and life-threatening condition for their infant, where to go to next, perhaps going to MDA or going to another patient advocacy organization or resources for finding specialists, resources for finding potential treatments, et cetera. So as I said, it's up to the state to decide what conditions are actually screened for. And each state uh, has different processes for adding new conditions onto their state panels. Sometimes it's the legislature that has to pass a bill that says we, the state of Ohio, let's say, is going to add uh, SMA onto our panel. Sometimes it's up to the public health department at the state. Sometimes it's up to the laboratory itself for that matter to determine uh, if a new condition is going to be added to their, uh, to their panel. But the reason for why it isn't automatic, just like that, that every single state will add a new recommended condition, I'll get to that recommendation process in a moment, uh, is that there, there can be impediments to states actually adding these newborn these new newborn screens onto their uh, panels. These impediments include the cost. Oftentimes, this involves the state having to buy a brand new machine for their public health laboratory that can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars. And that that wasn't necessarily in the budget uh, for the state to purchase. And of course, that public health laboratory now has to fit that machine somewhere in that laboratory. Sometimes states don't add a new screen onto their panel simply because they don't have the space, the physical space for the machine. In addition, they have to make sure they have enough lab, uh, enough laboratory technicians to run all these new tests. Uh, and these technicians have to have the training uh, to actually do all of this. And then the labs have to be up to date on quality assurance and ensure that uh, the validity and reliability of the tests that they're running aren't going to result in uh, false positives or false negatives. So it's not just an automatic uh, check the box exercise for a state to add a new screen onto their panel. It's that they actually have to go through a process to make sure that they're ready, that they have the financial resources as well as the human resources to actually conduct these states. So that's why I can, uh, th these, uh, these, new con uh, these new screens. So that's why it's not automatic for most states to just add a new, uh, a new screen to their panels. Now, as I've been alluding to, uh, you keep hearing me say that states are looking at the recommendations for what to be added. So while it is, while newborn screening is mostly a state-run program, the federal government still does have a role in newborn screening. And part of that role is to actually recommend to states what new screens should be added to their newborn screening processes. And this is a job of the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children. So this is an advisory body that is uh, located within the, uh, the uh, Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, that's the acronym. And this is within the Department of Health and Human Services in the federal government. And the, the role of this committee is to essentially try to take this burden off of the states, for the states to have to determine for themselves which new test should I be adding to my newborn screening program? Because if 50 states and plus DC plus the territories each had to go through this extensive process of deciding what's what condition, what screen is worth adding to my uh, to, to, to my uh, panel, um, that could only take longer and lead to states making all sorts of different decisions. Instead, the federal government has this federal entity to recommend to the states, we're going to do all the work for you. Just take a recommendation because we already did all the work to ensure that these new tests actually comply with um, the things that I already mentioned earlier are required for a test to be recommended. And actually, I, I will speak more to that in the context of Duchenne here in a moment. Now, the federal government isn't only doing that. The CDC also has a role to play, the Centers for Disease Control uh, and Prevention. They assist the laboratories in the quality assurance processes, making sure the public health laboratories are all set up and ready to go for newborn screening. Uh, the HRSA program doesn't just recommend these new screens. They also uh, help states with their follow-on processes, with their confirmatory testing processes. They offer a lot of technical assistance to states on how to run all of this. And then the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, at the NICHD, 
has a program specific to actually funding pilot programs to test new screens for new conditions that can be added to the recommended uniform screening panel. The panel that the federal government puts forward as here states is what we recommend that you actually screen for within your state. So while the new form screening isn't directly governed by the federal government, as you can hear, that's a state responsibility. Nonetheless, the federal government does play an incredibly important role in helping states and helping the newborn screening infrastructure more generally in actually advancing uh, in actually advancing uh, newborn screening further. So you might be wondering what actually is being recommended by the federal government right now. I don't expect you to actually read all of this. Apologies. This is really kind of the, the pithiest, the, the best graph I could find uh, of all the conditions as of 2018. Actually, this needs to be updated because there was a condition just the other week that was recommended for newborn screening. Um, these are the conditions that the federal government recommends states actually uh, screen for. Now, if you really squint, you can see glycogen storage disease type 2, that's Pompeii. The very bottom, you can see SMA, uh, uh, SMA1, uh, long name is SMA due to a homozygous deletion of exon 7, and then a number of other rare diseases here uh, that are fall within these categories of endocrinatic or uh, amino acid or, or, or other categories for that matter. Um, nonetheless, you can see that there are uh, a number of conditions that we're hoping will grow uh, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy here shortly. And as I also alluded to earlier, here's the map. Uh, here's the landscape of uh, states screening for neuromuscular diseases right now. To mention, there's the two, there's Pompeii and there's SMA. And in the orange, you can see states that are screening for both. And good for those states. Thank goodness for those states who have added uh, both SMA and Pompeii onto their state panels. But then you'll also see that some states are not screening for both. Some states are screening for just Pompeii. Those are rare. There you see Ohio, uh, South Carolina, and D.C., and then also you see even more states screening for just SMA and not screening for Pompeii yet. Those are in the uh, more kind of a, a pinkish reddish color. I don't know how, how best to describe that. Perhaps that color is different for you than it is for me. And then finally, there are still a handful, two states, I believe, just Nevada and Hawaii that screen for neither, unfortunately. They don't screen for SMA or Pompeii yet. And it's those states, of course, that we're paying attention to trying to get them to screen for at least one hopefully both uh, soon. But this map has been much, is getting much more colorful over the last couple of years. So we expect over the next year or two, hopefully, that this entire map is gonna be orange and that Pompeii and SMA will be screened for in all of these states, not just uh, a subset of them. Okay, so I've been teasing for a while now, the intersection of newborn screening and Duchenne muscular dystrophy, because of course we're gathered here to talk about Duchenne, not just kind of neuromuscular diseases or newborn screening more generally. So the reason for why this is an exciting time right now for Duchenne muscular dystrophy as it pertains to newborn screening is because at the end of June, so just about a month and a half ago, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy was actually nominated to the Secretary's Advisory Committee for Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children to be included in the recommended uniform screening panel. And really, I have to give pretty much all of the credit to Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, PPMD, for leading this effort. It has been PPMD that uh, started this effort by gathering clinicians, gathering uh, experts in Duchenne muscular dystrophy to, uh, to, to actually put together the nominating package to then submit to the Secretary's Advisory Committee uh, to actually nominate Duchenne muscular dystrophy for the recommended uniform screening panel. But we've been pleased to play at least a bit of a small role in not only co-sponsoring this nomination to uh, to, to, the, uh, to, to the Secretary's Advisory Committee, uh, essentially co-endorsing the nomination, but also to be providing our own experts to review the package and to uh, give some advice here or there on how best to prevent Duchenne muscular dystrophy to the, recommend, to, to the Secretary's Advisory Committee. So very, very grateful to be able to work with PPMD on the co-sponsorship of this package heading to the federal government. So what, what is within this nomination? What does all of this mean? Well, essentially what this nomination package includes is the evidence for why Duchenne actually qualifies to be considered for newborn screening. So I already kind of alluded to the qualifications already that are, that are, that are, are, are being sought by the Secretary's Advisory Committee. But just again, as a quick review, what this nomination includes is simply just, of course, a description of Duchenne muscular dystrophy and its progression and natural history and 
experience of, uh, of, of, of individuals, mostly boys, living with Duchenne. And why Duchenne muscular dystrophy does, of course, qualify as a serious uh, and life-threatening condition. I don't think I have to tell anybody, that's not news to anybody on this call, that uh, Duchenne is indeed quali does qualify as uh, a serious and life-threatening condition. Additionally, within this nomination package, there's, there's a description of the specific approach that newborn screening programs could take. And this is being informed by three different pilot programs that have, have uh, occurred over the course of the last several years. One that was led by uh, Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, PPMD, at, uh, at, um, in, in, in New York. Uh, actually, over the course of the last several years, PPMD, uh, uh, I'm being told to slow down just a bit. I will do so. Apologies. I get excited when I talk about this stuff. So PPMD... Uh, led an initiative in New York to test uh, if Duchenne muscular dystrophy could indeed be included on newborn screening uh, panels. At the very same time, MDA was partnering with the Research Triangle Institute in uh, North Carolina to also test whether Duchenne muscular dystrophy could be screened for a birth and how exactly that would look. And then up in Massachusetts, there was also a screening effort at Brigham Women's associated also with Cure Duchenne. Uh, to test at Brigham Women's if newborn screening could work within uh, the Duchenne muscular dystrophy context. And what we've all been finding is that, yes, it can. If one tests for, if one screens for elevated levels of CKMM at birth, that that elevated level of CKMM, and that is the presence of an enzyme, which I believe it's an enzyme, which indicates uh, damage that's occurring within the muscle. This is an enzyme the muscle tissue gives off if the damage happens to be occurring. Uh, that if one finds that, excuse me, if one finds that elevated CKMM at birth, that a confirmatory test can then be done to potentially find a, a muscular dystrophy, oftentimes it being Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So we found that this approach actually does work. It's been shown in New York. There are actually four boys that were diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy at birth in the New York pilot program. And then in the North Carolina program, there is one boy that has been diagnosed thus far, and that pilot is actually continuing and will continue into next year. Again, further providing evidence that Duchenne can be screened for at birth and can be diagnosed for at birth. In addition to you know, providing that evidence to the Secretary's Advisory Committee, this nomination package also uh, provides evidence for the treatments that then can be administered, if not directly after diagnosis with, new, with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy at birth, at least, you know, somewhat shortly thereafter, and definitely sooner than treatment would have been otherwise been able to been offered. So that could include corticosteroids, that could include exon skipping therapies, that could include potential future therapies that are making their way through pipelines such as gene therapies. We know that uh, Sarepta, for example, is intending on filing their biologic licensing application to the FDA uh, for um, their, their, their gene therapy for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So the fact that there are treatments that can be administered sooner than there would have been otherwise because of the diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy at birth, um, that, that again, is further evidence to the Secretary's Advisory Committee for why Duchenne muscular dystrophy could qualify for newborn screening. Uh, and then also detailing the follow-up process uh, for if there is a baby that is diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy soon after birth, uh, the infrastructure that already exists at MDA care centers, at care centers that are associated with PPMD or elsewhere, just any expert that is uh, any clinical experts and care center that has the comprehensive multidisciplinary care for individuals with Duchenne available, uh, that indeed uh, that would be available. So as you can see, uh, there, there's a lot within this nomination package that was submitted. We're very excited about this, but we also are very patient about this because we know that this is going to take some time. We're still very much at the beginning of this process. Uh, with the nomination package submitted, uh, PPMD, again, is, is the lead representative to the Secretary's Advisory Committee on this. And the latest I've heard when talking with them is that we're looking at uh, this to, uh, we're looking at, uh, hopefully, the committee will be able to uh, provide kind of feedback on all of this here shortly. 
And then there is a multi-step process from there. You're going to be hearing about this for, for a little while. Really, the quickest that I think any of us can expect this to take is at least a year, if not longer, because there's a lot of back and forth that happens between the Duchenne community and the Duchenne community organizations and clinical experts that are working on this in the Secretary's Advisory Committee. There's a multi-step process. There's going to be lots of discussion. Hopefully, within the next several years, Duchenne is going to be officially recommended uh, by the Secretary's Advisory Committee to be recommended by the Secretary of HHS for then states to be screening for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But it's going to take some patience, unfortunately, for this to officially get off the ground. We're certainly hoping that it will happen quickly, but we understand that it can take a little while for this to occur. I saw a few questions come in. Uh, I, I will, uh, if it's okay with Marissa, I will get to those at the end of my presentation. And I know that I am already running somewhat long. So let me just uh, give you a quick hint of the future of newborn screening as we're looking forward to it. And this is not just Duchenne specific, this is more general uh, for, for newborn screening, not only for Duchenne, but also for those with SBA, for those with Pompeii disease, uh, for those with other neuromuscular conditions. So right now you can you can hear that the current process that we have in many ways it doesn't work very well. It's it, it's it's uh, is 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 slow in uptake in getting new diseases actually re actually recommended by the federal government to states, and then states have a number of different uh, impediments to actually adding these new conditions onto their newborn screening panels. So what we're doing right now at MDA we're very pleased to be partnering with a number of other organizations that are thinking very innovatively on how newborn screening can be reformed. And this this can uh, this this take takes multiple different forms. This includes thinking about potentially employing regional labs rather than state based labs to take some of the pressure off of states, especially these very small states, uh, take some of the pressure off of them in having to add more uh, conditions to their newborn screening panels instead using kind of more of a centers of excellence approach, perhaps, for screening of, uh, of these blood spot cards at regional labs rather than state labs. Also considering new ways of expanding the process for reviewing these new recommended uniform screening panel conditions. Right now, the Secretary's Advisory Committee, with the resources they have, really can only review maybe one or two new conditions per year, uh, given the bandwidth that they have. And we know with the advent of gene therapies uh, picking up steam more and more and more that we might have that many more conditions that meet the criteria that I already outlined to you, uh, certainly more so than uh, the committee actually has a bandwidth to review. So thinking of new ways of actually getting this committee new resources, expanding their ability to review that much more quickly, uh, because the process we already take is going slowly, uh, we don't want it to go even slower as new conditions that might be very perfectly worthy to be added to the newborn screening panel are nominated. In addition, we're considering new ways of actually bringing genomic sequencing into the frontline newborn screening program. So no longer would we be employing metabolic screening, such as the screening of a CKMM for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but actually have genomic screening for these conditions as the newborn screen and that every infant uh, at birth is screened genomically for not only Duchenne, but also perhaps many other uh, neuromuscular diseases uh, to, to actually catch these diseases that much earlier. And then also reforms to adding new diseases on the state panels. And this is already something that our colleagues, such as at the Every Life Foundation and elsewhere, are thinking of innovatively, in which the process by which states decide to add a new condition onto their state panel via legislation, via the Department of Health, via a governor's signature, whatever it happens to be, there are better ways of doing this. And so coming up with new ways exactly to, uh, to, to reform that process is also under consideration. So as you can hear, the future of newborn screening is, is bright. There's a lot of great ideas out there. There's a lot of innovative ways uh, to actually uh, innovate in newborn screening to serve not only the neuromuscular disease community, but the rare disease community more broadly. So. Uh, where can you help out with all of this? So there are two things that I want to mention first. Uh, of course, you can join a grassroots network. I would love to have you on board to join us not only to advocate on newborn screening, but to advocate on all of those other things that I started out my presentation on. And you can do that by visiting nda.org backslash advocacy or to text NDA USA to 50457. But more specific to newborn screening, we actually have an action 
available right now. There is a bill that is in Congress called the Newborn, Save, New, Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act. And what this bill does is it reauthorizes and expands federal programs, uh, the federal programs I've already mentioned, uh, at the Health Resources Services Administration, HRSA, as well as at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the NIH, other programs that they fund. What this bill does is it increases funding for these programs, it updates the authorizing language to make sure they're keeping up with the latest technology in newborn screening. It actually just reauthorizes these programs more generally to ensure that they continue to have the congressional authorization to continue to operate. And then finally, the bill also commissions a study on the future of newborn screening to look at some of those exciting things that I already mentioned on a couple of slides back. So we need your help. We need your help to get this bill across the finish line. And what you can do is, again, you can visit us at mda.org backslash advocacy uh, to then send a letter to your senator in particular, because the bill's already actually passed the House of Representatives. We just need to get it across the finish line in the Senate email your senator to ask them to uh, support the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act so that we can get this bill uh, passed by the end of this Congress, the end of this Congress being the end of this year. So with that, I think that's everything that I had prepared, and I will be happy to stop sharing my screen and then uh, take any questions that uh, were submitted. So Marissa, do we have any questions that were submitted to us? We do, Paul. Um, one of the questions in the chat is, why is newborn screening for Duchenne so lagging so far behind SMA and Pompeii? Well, that's a good question. Um, and I think there is certainly one major facet that is uh, influencing this and potentially two. And I would defer to Duchenne experts on the call in the second, but the first pertains to the treatments that are available uh, to the respective conditions. Um, to those of you who are familiar with the treatments available in Pompeii disease and the spinal muscular atrophy, these are treatments, especially, well, in both cases, that are hugely, hugely transformative treatments. In the case of Pompeii disease, we know that enzyme replacement therapy if administered to, an, to a, an infant with infantile onset Pompeii disease, can actually prevent, prevent the cardiac implications of infantile onset Pompeii disease that have been unfortunately killing babies with infantile onset Pompeii disease for decades. So uh, absolute life-changing treatments available to these infants, really available to all individuals with Pompeii, that makes it quite obvious that newborn screening saves lives of individuals with Pompeii. Similarly with SMA, the treatments that have been improved over the course of the last 10 or 8 years, uh, first of course Benraza, but then later Zolgensma and most recently of RISD, that if taken by an infant with spinal muscular atrophy, including the gene therapy Zolgensma for that matter, uh, you know, leads to the avoidance perhaps of some of the most um, uh, so some of the most challenging symptoms, uh, perhaps life-threatening symptoms of spinal muscular atrophy. In fact, before these three treatments were available, we understand that SMA was the leading genetic killer of children under the age of two. That's now no longer the case. So within the context of SMA and Pompeii, they were very, very straightforward. It was obvious that, that, that newborn screening was the right way to go for these conditions. Now, with Duchenne and the, 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 the treatments that are available, we know that they can be very important, but they're, they're perhaps not quite as obvious. It's not, there, there isn't necessarily the, the clinical consensus that following a diagnosis at, let's say, seven days of Duchenne, that one of these treatments should be administered immediately, or that these treatments would have immediate effectiveness, or would be perfectly safe to take for that matter, or at least the, the benefits would outweigh the risks for an infant to take uh, these therapies. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, I believe the tests for Pompe disease and spinal muscular atrophy within the context of newborn screening were also rather straightforward. It was very obvious what should be tested for, what the screen could be, and then the, the, the process from there uh, for, for Pompe and for SMA. And this is again is where I would Duchenne to uh, I would uh, defer to Duchenne experts on whether the presence of elevated CKMM again, is as obvious of a screen 
as what Pompeii and SMA can be uh, screened for at birth. Now, of course, we're, we're, we're co co-sponsoring this nomination. We think that uh, screening for CKMM at birth should be included within the newborn screening panel, so we're convinced. But I think the general newborn screening ecosystem, the, the general newborn screening cognizanti, I guess you could say, uh, still has yet to be convinced. So I think that's why you see the difference between Pompeii and SMA and, and Duchenne. Duchenne just is, it hasn't been historically as much of a slam dunk as Pompeii and SMA are. Thank you, Paul. I don't think there are any more questions. I have to see one more that was sent uh, perhaps just to me. And the question is, could newborn, screens, newborn screening screens for Duchenne lead to diagnoses of other neuromuscular diseases that might also show elevated levels of CKMM at birth? Um, that's a very good question. And the answer is yes. And I can uh, give specific details about what we found within the North Carolina pilot project. For, that's being co-run by the Research Triangle Institute. Well, it's being led by the Research Triangle Institute, and MDA is grateful to be able to support uh, RTI's efforts. And uh, what we found at uh, in North Carolina is that elevated levels of CKMM have been found in infants born not only with Duchenne, but also with different forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy and different other forms of neuro, uh, neuromuscular myopathies. And so, co consequently. Actually, this is this, this is seen as a positive. We're finding other neuromuscular conditions at birth as kind of a, a, a silver lining or a, perhaps a side effect of screening for Duchenne. And so consequently, these families have a diagnosis that much earlier. But there are bioethical concerns with this. And, and, and the bioethical concerns lead to um, the, the requirement for newborn screening there to be a treatment that's available for the disease in question not just kind of no treatment available, we'll diagnose at birth, but then there's nothing to be done from there. Now we know, of course, that's not necessarily the case for these other limb girdles or these other uh, neuromuscular diseases, but there isn't necessarily a straightforward treatment approach as there is potentially within Duchenne, and as of course there is within uh, SMA and within Pompeii. So this is why this newborn screening effort focuses on Duchenne even if potentially other neuromuscular diseases can be found through elevated levels of CKMM, there is still the beneficial diagnosis that can be brought, but it's not that we're also nominating those conditions for newborn screening all at the same time. So there's this beneficial silver lining that's involved potentially, but still the newborn screening itself is focused on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, so Marissa, I think that is all that I see within the chat. So I am uh, perfectly happy to hand it back to you. Great. Thank you again, Paul.